The Tom Woods Show, episode 1502. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, by far one of the most dangerous economic misconceptions of the 20th century is that the financial crisis of 2008 was caused by deregulation. Unregulated capitalism led us here. It's dangerous because the next time this happens, they're going to come up with even worse solutions. So we got to get this one right, and you can if you read my free ebook, The Deregulation Boogeyman. Pick it up at regulationmyths.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Joel Gilbert, documentary filmmaker, joins me today. He has just released a documentary and book called The Trayvon Hoax, Unmasking the Witness Fraud that Divided America. This, of course, is a reference to Trayvon Martin, and uh, we're going to be talking about that and obviously the um, altercation with George Zimmerman. Well, that case, I don't need to tell you, consumed America for quite some time and with people taking sides. And it turns out that there is a fundamental witness fraud that's taking place at the heart of that case. And the fact that it took this one person to dig it out, when you had all these resources, I suppose, available, tells you a little something about the information that, well, it tells you that there's a certain narrative that this case is supposed to fit into. And whatever needs to be done to force it into that narrative will be done. This is a very, um, I don't know what really word to describe, disturbing Uh, very arresting, so to speak, uh, documentary. It was recommended to me by somebody in my group. I'll mention that. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But it's something you should check out. That's for sure. Joel, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me today. I watched the documentary, The Trayvon Hoax, uh, just yesterday and finished it up this morning. And I am so glad we're talking. Uh, I'm very, very interested in this. It's a really, really excellent job. Let's start off with something you address right off the bat, which is what initially led you down this particular path? There are many things in American society that need investigating. Why this one in particular for you? Well, I knew that uh, the Trayvon Martin case was the dividing point where uh, race relations took a dive. Uh, Before that, race relations were rated as positive by both black and white, and it's been negative ever since. And this was the turning point really where the era in modern times of fake news and race hoaxes all started. It all went downhill from here. And I started to look at it because of Andrew Gillum, the Florida governor's candidate that came out of nowhere and almost won. And he was always talking about Trayvon Martin, like he built his career on this case. And that made me go back and look at it. And uh, the first thing I noticed, and I even remembered, of course, is that the witness, key witness that caused the uh, arrest of Zimmerman And then later in court was this Rachel Gentel, the kind of plus-sized 18-year-old at the time, Haitian-American girl. People remember her because she said she couldn't read cursive and her appearance was a disaster in court. And I went back and remembered the timeline. I'll reset that for you. If people recall that after this tragic shooting, February 26, 2012, the Sanford, Florida police investigated, they looked at the... 911 calls, physical evidence, eyewitnesses, Zimmerman statements, and, you know, testing him. And they came up two weeks later, March 12, and said it's self-defense. It's not even a stand your ground. It's a pure self-defense case. Everything points to self-defense. It's over. They brought in Al Sharpton, started protesting on the streets. Out of the blue, uh, a week later, the Martin family attorney, Benjamin Crump, held a press conference and he held up a digital recorder and he said, we just found Trayvon's girlfriend who's 16 years old. Her name is Diamond Eugene. And uh, we were on the phone with her, did a phone recording last night. And he plays a couple of excerpts that are kind of unintelligible. And he says, we got all the evidence now. And I'm giving this tape to the FBI, to Obama's FBI. The next day, Obama says, If I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. And then LeBron James comes on board, all because of this girlfriend recording that no one really understood what she was saying. And then the state of Florida, from all these protests and petitions, they kind of pressured into appointing a special counsel. Two weeks later, the state attorneys come down to Miami to interview the girlfriend, Diamond Eugene. And the 
police actually go to Diamond Eugene's house to pick her up. I've got the unredacted address. And they're sent to a different house, to the home of a woman who works for Sabrina Fulton, for Trayvon's mother. And at that home, Rachel Gentel appears. And she says, I'm Rachel Gentel, but my nickname is Diamond Eugene. And she goes to do this interview with prosecutors. I've got the uh, tape. She says, I lied about my name. I lied about my age. I lied about going to the hospital. And she doesn't know anything about what happened that night. And it actually contradicts what the f- girl on the phone said. For instance, the girl on the phone, Diamond Eugene, said it was, she said it was raining hard. Rachel Jantel says it wasn't raining. And at the end of this ridiculous interview, Rachel actually confesses to prosecutors. It's actually in the trailer. She tells them over and over, I feel guilty. I feel real guilty. They say, why? She says, I know about it. She's telling them. And they ignore her. They end the interview. And two weeks later, they put together an affidavit of arrest based on some of Rachel's statements that are ridiculous, that contradict all the evidence and all the eyewitnesses. And then, of course, a year later, it goes to court. And they have this racially divisive trial and all the racial division in the country. So what I did is I decided I'm going to find this Diamond Eugene. And if I can find her and find out why, if she was the real girlfriend, the real girl on the phone, and why she was switched for Rachel Gentile, who knew about it. And that's what I did. I put together the entire film and the book that explains this spectacular witness fraud that led to this epic race hoax and racial division in our country. The detective work you do to track down this Diamond Eugene is very, very interesting. I'm, I mean, I've, as I say, I've watched the documentary. I've watched you go into high schools and acquire yearbooks and then go through. And then the problem is it's hard to identify people because of different hairstyles and this and that. And plus there are people named Diamond, people named Eugene, people whose middle name might be Diamond – I mean, I don't know how you how you did it. Yeah, it was it, look. It was quite an effort. The first thing I did is I got a hold from the uh, courts of Trayvon Martin's 750 page cell phone records that had 3,000 photos, 3,000 text messages, 1,500 contacts, and I learned all about Trayvon and his background. And I kind of got to know Trayvon in the last eight months of his life, and I concluded that he was not a rocket scientist as the media made him out to be, nor was he a thug or a bad kid. He was a good kid that ended up going in a downward spiral. When his uh, father divorced his stepmother, Alicia Stanley, he uh, started acting out very badly because he lost his home base. He lost his stepmother 14 years, and he got into uh, heavy marijuana use, uh, gun dealing, uh, fighting all the time, and getting suspended for fighting. So he was in this downward spiral that led to his horrible decision to attack Zimmerman. And also what stood out is the girlfriend named Diamond is texting him photos of herself and they're right there. It's not Rachel Gentile. It's unmistakable. So the fact that I could go get all this information and just look at it and figure it out in a few months tells you all you need to know about why the prosecutors withheld so much evidence from Zimmerman's defense, because uh, it's so obvious that this girl is not Rachel Gentile. And I actually get into Diamond Eugene's uh, social media. She's tweeting all the time, every 20 minutes, even right after Trayvon is shot, she tweets about it. So I put together this day-by-day story of what really happened and who knew about it. And uh, people that see it are just amazed. So it is number one uh, book on Amazon, new release. You can go to the TrayvonHooks.com and see the trailer and also live stream it. All right. I, before we get into the Diamond Eugene thing, which really is the the big bombshell here, reconstruct for me how people without this evidence that you're bringing forth, and let's say without her testimony one way or the other, were still – able to come down really hard on one side or the other of this. There were people who were convinced that Trayvon was in the right, people who were convinced that Zimmerman was in the right. Reconstruct for us the grounds on which they were able to make these arguments so confidently, and then we'll get into Diamond Eugene. Look, it was just a false narrative that the attorney for uh, the Martin family put together along with a publicist named Ryan Julison early on. They got started very early, even while the police were still investigating And their false narrative was simply that Trayvon was a small black child who was on a candy run trying to get candy for his brother. And when he came back, a thuggish white, you know, racist hunted him down, held him at gunpoint for 40 seconds while he screamed for help and then shot him in cold blood. This was the story. Now, the media ran with that unquestioned. 
because of politics. They wanted to get Barack Obama reelected later that year. The black vote was not in the pocket for Obama because nothing had changed. Nothing had gotten better and everything got worse. Higher taxes, all the businesses were going away, more unemployment, illegals were coming in, taking their jobs and driving down wages. The media and the Obama administration wanted to find a formula to use Trayvon Martin's death to get black people out to vote for Obama. It was a very evil plan. They sent the uh, Department of Justice, sent their community relations service down to Sanford immediately to, quote, investigate. And instead, we've got the documents. They tried to simply organize protests. So it's a very evil plan to use the tragic death of a black teenager who was very troubled to put a Hispanic man in prison, George Zimmerman, to control black voters. And this is what they were up to. And the media was on board. This is where the fake news started. It wasn't this bad until this case. All right. So now let's get into the Diamond Eugene mystery. First of all, I I just want to make sure I'm completely getting the significance of this. Are you telling me that in the actual trial, this was a case of they put an imposter basically on the stand? or uh, So in other words, the, the woman you found, was she at all part of the trial? The woman I found, a Diamond Eugene, her first name is Brittany, it's her legal name, middle name Diamond Eugene, uh, she was Trayvon's girlfriend for the month of February. She was on the phone with him for five, six hours a day, exchanging 50, 60 text messages a day. She was on the phone with him just before he was shot. She's the one that she tried to disappear. Uh, she refused to say anything, and you can, as you have to watch the film and you can see why based on what she really knew of what happened. She tried to disappear. Trayvon's friends were hammering her with phone calls, emails, uh, text messages to try to get her to come and say something. And she refused. Uh, She got pressured by Trayvon's father to try to come say something. And under duress, she's tweeting about it. She's tweeting about it and saying she's under extreme duress. And she agrees to talk to uh, Trayvon's mother and attorney Benjamin Crump under duress. Then she talks to them over the phone. They record this phone call. And in the phone call, she's just basically agreeing with Crump. Everything he says, was Trayvon happy that day? Yes. Uh, Did he do anything wrong? No. What would happen? Well, he was just getting some Skittles and iced tea for his brother. Didn't do anything wrong. So she's kind of 16 years old. She doesn't want to come forward for very good reasons. And when she does, she just repeats this standard nonsense from Crump. A week later, they tell her, hey, look, the cops are coming. We want you to go and tell them the story. And she refuses to follow the script. She bails out. And Rachel Gentel is substituted for a legitimate phone witness. This is what I call the Trayvon hooks. It's a legitimate real witness to the minutes before Trayvon's death was switched for a fake witness, Rachel Gentel, who then, based on a couple of her statements that contradicted all the evidence, they went ahead and indicted Zimmerman. Then she came to court a year later to continue this farce to try to put him in jail. And uh, the Trayvon hooks is also the name I give to the hoax that the media plays on black Americans every day. And that hoax is that black people should vote Democrat to protect themselves from a racist America where white people want to hurt you because of your skin color. This is the nonsense. Think about Jesse Smollett, you know, the beyond ridiculous attack by Trump supporters at 2 a.m. in Sub-Zero Chicago. Hands up, don't shoot. It all came from this case. So I'm making the point in the film that This case divided us for no reason. It was an epic race hoax, another Al Sharpton race hoax, like Tawana Brawley, where they use fakery to try to bring a case to divide the country. We're going to continue this conversation in just a minute after this break. Folks, let's take a minute to talk about something that, let's face it, you and I for a long time thought was something other people do. I don't do that. That's something other people do. But funny thing about those other people, you notice they have less stress, They seem more confident about life. They seem better able to cope with the challenges they face every day. So maybe by meditating, those people are onto something. But what's an easy way to get started? Of course, the Simple Habit app. Here you can find short meditations taking only five minutes that you can consume without having to be in a dark room all by yourself. These are meditations that can help you with specific problems in your life. And I urge you to give it a try and see if it has the results for you that it's had for so many other people. Over 65,000 
five-star reviews for this thing. Hundreds of meditations are available for free and thousands with the premium subscription. Well, go to simplehabit.com slash woods to get that premium subscription for 30% off. That's right. Go to simplehabit.com slash woods and take 30% off the premium subscription. All right, so now that we've got this story, we're kind of uh, unwinding here. I, I do want to just point out Maybe I, I don't want to. I don't want to give away everything. I want people to watch this thing, okay? So I, don't, I want there to be more for people to to learn on their own. But one way that you can know that that this Brittany Diamond Eugene you're talking about was in that situation highly suggestible and was in effect responding to, frankly, what were prompts by Attorney Crump is that when he he says to her, uh, "Did he seem to be happy in the course of talking to him that day?" She said, oh yeah, yeah, he was happy. We have the text record. <laughs> he's not happy at all. No. She's saying terrible things to him, and he's very unhappy about them the whole day. Well, they're, they're in conflict all the time. Even the entire month of February, it goes back and forth where they're hanging up on each other. They're breaking up. They're back in love. It's a sexualized relationship. It's a highly volatile relationship. So, yeah, you can see some of the excerpts of the conversation with Crump on the phone that helped bring this whole thing forward. She's just you know, uh, she's under extreme duress at 16 years old. She doesn't want to say anything. And when you look at the film in the book, you'll see why that she knew a lot more that points to Trayvon as an aggressor. And uh, it would not be very popular based on what was happening to come forward at 16 years old and say something that no Trayvon is not the second coming of Jesus uh, so she just kind of went along with whatever Crump led the witness. And, um, you know, she had other issues, which we won't go, we'll make you watch the film. But one of the issues is she did not, I don't think, wanted to go uh, lie to prosecutors. Uh, unfortunately, she seemed to have made a ridiculously terrible decision uh, to have or be part of and knowing that Rachel Gentel would substitute for her. And it was just a diabolically ingenious 16-year-old idea, and others knew about it. Uh, when you look at the film, you'll see and read the book. Uh, but you know, she uh, Rachel Gentel comes to the interview and said, "I lied about my name. I'm not. I'm, I'm Diamond Eugene. It's really Rachel Gentel. I lied about my age. I'm 18, not 16." Now, why the prosecution didn't say, "Okay, let's just stop this nonsense right here, young lady." Uh, they were hell bent on getting anything from her to get an indictment and the complicity of the Florida state prosecutor's office office uh, is going to be uh, something that people are going to be very concerned about. And when you realize how much evidence they withheld, it's just hard to believe that they didn't know this with all their subpoena powers and everything else. Right, right, right. Now, am I remembering the documentary correctly that your interview with George Zimmerman was his first since the trial? Well, don't forget, he never even testified at his own trial. So it's really the first interview. He talked to Hannity back in 2012, uh, but this was much more in depth and really gave a good explanation as to a lot of things uh, that we didn't know about. So Zimmerman gives a pretty good interview, and you really understand things from his perspective with, uh, with a lot of evidence supporting it. When you spoke to him, did you tell him about what you had found? Uh, when I spoke to him, I hadn't found everything. It was still in the process. Um, he knew that I had discovered a witness fraud at the heart of the case. Uh, he did tell me he wasn't surprised by it because uh, he said everything that Rachel said in court, uh, he knew to be false because he was there. He said uh, Trayvon said this to Zimmerman and Zimmerman said this to Trayvon. And he said none of that happened. So he knew something was very wrong. Now, I talked to Zimmerman's attorneys and this is interesting, and uh, Mark O'Mara said, well, Rachel was such a terrible witness. Why would anyone use her as a fake witness? And I explained to him, I said, listen, nothing any phone witness could say would overcome the physical evidence and the actual eyewitnesses. So I said it was never about convicting Zimmerman necessarily. It was about getting the case, uh, getting Zimmerman arrested for the family, they could file a, a lawsuit against the homeowners association. They got almost two million dollar payout, oh. and, then, and then the political agenda to get him into court was to be able to inflame uh, the black voters and black youth and organize and mobilize them to uh, come out and vote for Obama. 
What were your impressions of Zimmerman when you met him? Uh, look, he's he's very personable. Yes, sir, and no, sir. I learned things I didn't know that, you know, he, this guy was an Obama supporter. He was a social rights activist. Hispanic kid speaks fluent Spanish. He spent his spare time at that time mentoring black youth, kids, black kids whose parents were in prison. He was in this mentor program. He'd take them to play basketball, take them out to dinner. I mean, this guy was a walk the walk, talk the talk minority advocate. And they made him out to be some kind of white racist who was wanting to shoot someone because of their skin color. I mean, nothing could be more absurd. Uh, so everyone can judge Zimmerman for themselves. You know, go to the TrayvonHoax.com, check out the trailer. Uh, the other thing also in the trailer, the news that he said for the first time, he told someone in the media, myself, Trayvon, last words, final words. He said he heard Trayvon say, please tell Mama Alicia I'm sorry. And that right there told Trayvon's story more than anything else. Uh, he lost his stepmother and he wanted George to let his stepmother know that he, he was sorry. He knew, he knew he had done something wrong. Yeah. Now you, I don't know if this is something you want to talk about here, but because he does have these final words, uh, Trayvon, and you say in the documentary that you wanted to try to figure out what he meant by that. Do you want to elaborate on that? Sure, yeah. So Trayvon's uh, stepmother uh, was Alicia Stanley. She appeared on CNN with uh, Anderson Cooper several times explaining, and she said to him, it's pretty clear, it took me a while to figure it out, but you put it all together. She said, Trayvon wanted to live with me and his father. She's really explaining that Trayvon was going through a crisis and acting out because he had lost his home base. He had to leave her home when his father divorced her and went back to live with his mother. And this is what was a real crisis. Uh, so one of the lessons of the film, I say, is the problem for black youth is not armed white men in the streets. The problem for black youth is the lack of strong black men in the home to give them guidance away from gangs, drugs, fighting, all the things that Trayvon got into where he was acting out his uh, pain at uh, losing his mother, stepmother. Now, after an episode like this in our history, it's easy to say, well, in the future, we're going to have to be a little bit more careful and dispassionate when evaluating evidence. But you and I know perfectly well that given the narrative that exists out there, that's very, very difficult. That's much easier said than done. And it's true for a lot of people that we look at the world through a lens of what we expect it to be like. And if you expect the world to be a particular way, let's say, for example, in the way blacks are treated, then each episode as it unfolds is going to tend to confirm that bias. And then when later on exculpatory evidence comes forward, well, it's too late. I mean, and no one's even willing to listen at that point. So is there really a solution to this? Well, what happened is the very opposite. When the social activists saw that they could make up a slogan, Skittles and iced tea, he just had Skittles and iced tea and the guy shot him. Then why not make up a slogan, hands up, don't shoot? He was he was trying to surrender. He said, hands up, don't shoot me, please. So it had the opposite effect. They actually had a hearing to um, install a Supreme Court justice, and fake witnesses came forward. They didn't even bother to see if they were even worth going before the, you know, the committee. They just usher them right in. Tell your story. And the media, oh, you know, Brett Kavanaugh did this at a party. So it actually encouraged the media and social activists to come up with these ridiculous stories, knowing that the media would never question them or look into them. I looked into this, and it, the information was just sitting there. But why didn't the media do what I did? Because it didn't fit their race-fueled fear narrative that they want to instill in black Americans, the Trayvon hoax. There's America is racist. I grew up in the 80s in Tennessee. Black and white kids all together from six years old never heard the N-word. If somebody had said it, everybody would have jumped on them. Never had any racial issues whatsoever. So they want to tell us that 30 years on in 2012, all of a sudden America is racist and everything's racist. It's the dumbest, most insulting narrative that came into politics through the media and the Democrat Party that you, could, you couldn't have imagined that, that they would accuse America of being racist. Uh, Colin Kaepernick, partly because of the Trayvon hoax, he starts to protest America. Then it becomes acceptable. Then it becomes mainstream to hate America. It's all a big hoax. 
It all started with the Trayvon hoax. The witness was fake. The narrative was fake. It's time to unfake the news and get rid of this ridiculous story of racism. So the website then is thetrayvonhoax.com, and there are multiple ways you can consume this content. So can you just run down that for everybody? Yeah, go to thetrayvonhoax.com, the buy page. Uh, there's a paperback. That'll bump you over to Amazon. There's an ebook on Kindle. Also go to Amazon. The ebook is available on any site that you ever saw an ebook. It's on other sites. And you can buy the DVD also. On Amazon, there's a slight delay. They're still getting in more stock. But on uh, my website, I ship them every day, DVDs. And you can also live stream on Vimeo, the full movie, or you can go to my website, The Trayvon Hoax, and it'll link you up there to Vimeo to live stream. Okay, so also to, to make it uh, even easier, on our show notes page, all you got to do is remember this is episode 1502. So tomwoods.com slash 1502. I will link to everything Joel just mentioned so you can conveniently access them from there. So this uh, was this released just this month? Uh, last week at the National Press Club in D.C., I held a film screening uh, for the press, and uh, it got released on Amazon and also on my website. So it's been out about a week and a half. And it's just been tremendous feedback so far. Uh, people are just amazed by this. It's very, very interesting and compelling. As I told you before we started recording, somebody in my private uh, Facebook group watched a very, very, very intelligent person, uh, educated in the law, uh, watched it and was absolutely flabbergasted by it. And so my initial thought was, should I get the guy on? <laughs> and uh, yes, absolutely, you should. Good so move. I'm glad we did that. The TrayvonHoax.com is the website. Uh, I hope folks will check it out. Joel, but best of luck and thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks. All right, folks, guess what's happening next week on The Tom Wood Show? Dave Smith Week is happening. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. In the meantime, make sure and go grab your copy of my brand new ebook, AOC is Wrong. Costs you nothing. This costs you nothing, this ebook. And it just smashes one position after the other. Where do you get it? Well, where else? AOCIsWrong.com. See you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free. And we'll see you next time. Like the sound of the Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.